He spoke, and the invisible realm gave birth to all that is seen. Now, this is another key. Everything, the landscape, the animals, the bugs, the uh, water, the sky, everything was first in the imagination of God. See, that's why the enemy tries to steal visualization. He saw all that we see now, of course, better. You know, it's been kind of abused. But everything that he created, he saw first. And because he's a spirit of faith, when he spoke, there was power, dunamis power, that was behind his words. So again, that's why confessing before you believe is useless. Can you imagine if God didn't believe that when he spoke it was going to happen? We might have like crazy stuff that came out. Like combinations of birds and bugs or something. I don't know. Like, there's just no telling. You know. But he saw it. He spoke it because he's a spirit of faith. Secondly, there's not, nothing more powerful than speaking forth in faith. It is impossible for faith to fail. Only prayers that go answer, unanswered are those that are not his will, those without true faith, and those with wrong motives. Those are the three things. You're asking out of His will, you don't have faith, or you've got wrong, wrong motives. And it's very easy to find His will. You just read the Bible. Alright, now we're going to move into Abel. Okay, Faith moved Abel to choose a more acceptable sacrifice to God, to offer God, than his brother Cain. And God declared him righteous. This is a pattern with faith. God declared him righteous because of his offering of faith. By his faith, Abel still speaks instruction to us today, even though he is long dead. Faith is multi-generational. It goes on and on and on and on. Okay, let's break this down really quick. Oh, we're going to go ahead and read about Enoch. Faith translated Enoch from this life, and he was taken up into heaven. He never had to experience death. He just disappeared from this world because God promoted him. For before he was translated to the heavenly realm, his life had become a pleasure to God. And I don't know how the mirror phrases it, Kathy, but if you see anything neat, let me know. Okay. Abel offered a blood sacrifice. Cain offered the sacrifice of his crops. What was the problem? Some are like, well, you know, because he was trying to be under the law. The law didn't exist. Later we see that grain offerings were actually a very sa uh, uh, fine sacrifice to the Lord. It wasn't that. It was this. Both of them received a revelation from Adam and Eve that blood covers sin. Cain refused to offer that sacrifice. So he did his own. He's the epitome of the first religious Pharisee. He didn't want to do it God's way. How do we know they knew that? Because God sacrificed animals and clothed them. You know he didn't just you know shoot with a bow at a deer or something and skinned it and said, here you go, throw those on. I'm sure the Lord explained what he was doing. Remember, they covered themselves with fig leaves and they still felt naked. But then God came and performed the very first sacrifice. I mean, there's so much prophetic in there. It's unbelievable. And then He clothed them and covered them. Right? They would have passed that on to Cain and Abel. They would have told them about the garden. They would have told them about listening to the serpent. They would have told them all of that and they would have trained them. In fact, they were probably twins. And they would have trained them in the blood sacrifice, but Cain didn't want to do it that way. Abel took that revelation and decided he would offer him the best and the first of all of his sheep. And here's the original uh, Hebrew and Aramaic of that incident. It says, and I love this, that when Abel offered that, which by the way, it ended up him getting murdered, but when he offered that sacrifice at great cost, okay, God sat back in heaven and looked around and said, did you guys just see that? 
That's, that's how much it impacted them. Okay? Now, Enoch, this is crazy. Enoch is one of my favorite people. Enoch <laughs> was snatched up to heaven because he lived by a faith that fueled his passion and strength in seeking God. He became obsessed with God. In fact, I think he's probably the closest human to Jesus before Jesus to experience, the closest to God. Now, in verse 6 it says, And without faith, living, living faith, without living faith within us, it, is, uh, it would be impossible to please God. For we come to God in faith, knowing He's number one real, and that He rewards the faith of those who give all their passion and strength into seeking Him. We need to make a place for faith to dwell. Faith should be at home in us. It should not be a struggle. Faith is based in love. Okay? So let's look at Galatians 5, 6. We're almost done, actually, because the rest is kind of reading a lot about Sarah. In Galatians 5, 6, in the Passion Translation, it says, When you're placed into the Anointed One, and joined to him, circumcision, circumcision and religious obligations benefit you nothing. All that matters now is living in the faith that is activated and brought to perfection by love. Okay, now this is interesting. It tells us a few things. Number one, faith has to be living. Number two, it has to be active. Number three, it matures. Faith grows. It strengthens. It's it, that's why I say just be honest. God isn't upset if you don't yet have faith for what you're asking for. What He would get upset with is if you continue to disbelieve Him. But, why is it perfected by love? Any thoughts? So grace is the empowerment based on love. love. Okay. Anybody else? Love is in your heart. And when you love somebody, it doesn't matter what they do. As long as you have love, you can forgive anything. Mm -hmm. so. There's something to that. Anybody else? Is it what I'm covering sin? No. no. Well, I mean, it could be because along those lines, the idea is that because you know He loves you, even if you're a stinker, He'll still answer your prayer. Because yeah. people will say, I already forgive you, but I don't love you. Right. But it's how love you can forgive. You have to love, literally love the person to forgive the person. Right. Here's the thing. When you know you're loved by someone and you ask a request of them, you know they're going to give it to you. Yeah. That's so it's trust. Trust dwells in love. So then the question is, okay, so if you break it down, so trust dwells in love, faith is agreement, or trust and father. When you break that down, that means that if you are having trouble believing for a specific promise in your life, there is a breakdown of trust because there's a breakdown of how would you put it a revelation of his love for you okay so that that's very important because a lot of people are trying to believe a father that they're not sure loves them unconditionally right we talked about people offering sacrifices of going to church and tithing and blah blah to you know get rid of that guilty conscience the heart that condemns them that's why it's so crucial I don't care if I have just done something wrong in the Lord's eyes. All I have to do is say, I'm sorry. Hey, Father, would you mind doing this for me? It, it, that's just how it is, right? So faith is activated and brought to perfection by love. And I would just add on by knowing His love for you. Okay? Now, 
love here is agape. But listen to this definition. I had never heard it. To have love for someone or something based on sincere appreciation and high regard with affection. So there's thankfulness and affection there, right? This, excuse me, type of love requires relationship. And with relationship comes revelation of his love for you that then activates and perfects your faith. Faith will not grow apart from love. You have to be growing in the understanding of how much he loves you. In fact, he showed me this morning, um, I was like, you know, pondering, you know, um, my arm and things like that. And the Lord said, you know you've been having a fear. Oh, I had a fear? He goes, yeah. He said, you've been having a fear that you have no health insurance. And so you're, you're like you're getting older. And so you may need health insurance because you're getting older. He said, so where's your trust? Is it in me or is it in health insurance? Well, obviously health insurance. Interesting. And I, I started looking back like, okay, you know, as you age, your spine, you know, it starts doing weird things. And maybe I now have, you know, a bulging disc. And now, you know, I'm going to have to have surgery. And, you know, like all this crazy stuff goes in your head. Or what if I, like, fall down the stairs in my slipper and I break something again? And, you know, and there's one thing to not be an idiot, you know, and just fall down stairs. But I thought that was a very interesting thing. So, because I was pondering, how come I can literally pull a grate out of an oven at 380 degrees and not... Gigi, show them your hand. Well, it should be all totally bruised. He accidentally, he was turning over and slammed his hand in his metal, like, bed thing. Yeah. And with it, the thinners, he would have, it would have been well, the, covered. Like this one here, just for barely touching something. Yeah. And one over here, barely but I mean, I went, bam! And I mean, it hurt. And immediately, I just started speaking that it, it's not, there's got to be any bruising, no uh, pain. All he that. pulled a sherry. Uh, and then I wanted to look at it right then. I said, but it was pretty dark in the room. So I said, well, I'll check it in the morning. Which is probably good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I did check it when I got it. I look at that. We're cool. Yeah. Because yeah. it would have been. Cool. A, you've seen it when I get a pretty good one. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's huge. This yeah. would have been covered the whole yeah. yeah so I was pondering how can I can how come I can do that and yet this has been a five-week uh, situation and it was fear oh I'm probably gonna have to have surgery or shots so what was I doing I think about Gigi I had some neck thing and he had to have shots and I thought about other people that had to have their spine fused you painted a picture. oh I painted a picture <laughs> so then I'm like I need to change that picture yeah, yeah. But it was interesting. It was very, very interesting. So what is that? That is, okay, well, there, there's past evidence that people had to have certain things happen. And so I was focusing on that evidence instead of the evidence that I've already collected that God is faithful and true and I've already been healed. It's a very interesting thing. But just to share, you know, some of why, why do we get stuck in these loops and then we wonder why nothing is changing or why we're only having a measure now, at the same time, because it's according to the faith you have, right? Jesus said that over and over and over. He said that over and over. You're healed according to your faith. The other side of it is sometimes healing is therapeutics, meaning in the original language, there is a process of recovery. So when I look back at when I had mono, it was a process of recovery of which God equipped me with specific secret weapons that I could then pass on to other people. But I guarantee you, if I would have had the revelation of healing that I have today, there's no way I would have been sick for a full three years. When God told me, you're halfway there at the year and a half mark, I'm like, wow, okay. He wasn't saying that was his will. He was just letting me know that's where that's you're at. Where at. <laughs> just because he tells you something doesn't mean that's what he wants. I probably should have said, what? Another year and a half? No. I do not want another year and a half. 
No way. I'm going to get my faith where we can fast track this sucker. You know what I mean? Just because he speaks doesn't mean he's telling you that's what he wants. We need to ask him questions, guys. Because when we hear Holy Spirit, we think that's it. He's probably like, no, that's where you're at. How about you ask where I'm at? So that was, that right there, if you take nothing away, that that's probably very beneficial. It's like my fear is that not having the health insurance is good. Where I've been preaching about being healed. <laughs> that I worry that, okay, that hasn't gone away yet. Why am I, why am I sick if I'm over here preaching? Oh, but, you know, what is oh, it yeah. Like to them? Oh, yeah. yeah. Remember when I we had to do healing rooms with my broken foot? Yeah. <laughs> Try doing yeah. that. You know, and it's like, yeah. please pardon this huge boot that's on my foot. You know, but what was interesting that people kept, oh, I didn't even notice. Why? Because people are there about them. They need a healing. They didn't even notice my foot. But I'm the one, look. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I felt this need to explain why I'm still wearing a boot. But don't let that affect your healing. So after the first two people, the Lord's like, what are you doing? I'm trying to make sure that people have faith. You don't need to worry about my reputation. You're worried about your reputation. Mm. Right there. Right in the heart. And I'm like, you're right. It's ego. He goes, yeah, don't worry about that. Just pray and they'll be healed. I'm like, okay. And that's what I did. And no one ever noticed. <laughs> so it's very interesting how we are when we think that we're trying to protect God and His reputation when it actually, it can tend to be our own. Now, I'm not saying that's you, but it was for me. No, it is. <laughs> okay, well, there you go. <laughs> that's for free, Roberta. Okay. On the flip side, your high regard of love for him also activates and perfects faith. Now, I love this. This is so good in Ephesians 3, 17 through 19. This is a great apostolic prayer to pray over yourself. Then by constantly, did you notice that? Constantly using your faith. Constantly. The life of Christ will be released deep inside you. And the resting place of his love will become the very source and root of your life. And there's so much to unpack, which we're not going to do. But it then says, Then you will be empowered to discover what every Holy One experiences, the great magnitude of the astonishing love of Christ in all of its dimensions, how deeply intimate and far-reaching is His love, how enduring and inclusive it is, endless love beyond measurement that transcends our understanding. Excuse me. This extravagant love pours into you until you are filled to overflowing with the fullness of God. Okay, now it's hard to see which comes first, faith or love. Because it's by constantly using your faith that you begin to make a home for love. And then as you make a home for love, you then see all the dimensions of love and then that then makes your faith full and then you start overflowing with the fullness of God. I mean, I don't know which comes first. But we do know that you need both in order to experience these realities. Well, you said by love you're making a home for faith. And then so by faith you're, you're making a home for love. Think it comes to love. Yeah, but look, because it says right here, by constantly using your faith, the life of Christ will be released and the resting place of His love will become the very source and root of your life. I guess you could say, let's say that love is a house. You get a key, right? So you get a key to unlock your door. So you want to unlock love. It's faith. Turn it, it's unlocked. Okay, so maybe we can phrase it that way. So by you unlocking that door so that love can become that resting place, you're now going to begin to experience love in all of its dimensions, which is the highest pursuit you can have because God is love. Remember that word y'all gave to... Uh, female zero, one, two, and it was love. Love, 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 love. Everywhere was love, right? So that's what this is referring to. Now, <clears throat> Hebrews 11, 7, 7, 11. Faith opened Noah's heart to receive revelation and warnings from God about what was coming, even things he had never seen. But Because he, he'd never seen rain. Y'all knew that, right? It had never rained before. 
But he stepped out in reverent obedience to God and built an ark that would save him and his family. Get this. By his faith, the world was condemned. But Noah received God's gift of righteousness that comes by believing. Have you ever thought about your faith condemning others? Well, it says that the Jews will look on to the Gentile. Yeah, and become and, well, convicted or convicted, are jealous. jealous, want what we yeah. have. And I think that's kind of that same picture that they're kind of convicted just because they see what about it. And not only that, faith equals results. So when you have faith and you're getting results in life, all of a sudden the blessings you receive are evidence. Okay? The favor of God is on you, but with it comes persecutions. Because people will either want what you have because you're so blessed, or they will be jealous over what you have because you're so blessed. Isn't that interesting? So it really depends on the heart of the person, but you're absolutely correct. So by his faith, the world was condemned, meaning that Noah believed the warnings and revelation from God about what was coming that spurred him to action. And by his action, he brought the judgment on the world. Very interesting. Jesus asked the question, will I find faith when I return? <clears throat> so... <clears throat> Faith and love, to me, like the love of many will grow cold, he's referring to believers, are very uh, two important things that we need to stay on top of. On top of that, Noah, just like Abel, was declared righteous because he uh, believed. We are made the righteousness of God now when we believe in Jesus Christ. Back then, Noah couldn't live in heaven yet because he died in his fallen nature, but his faith in God was equal to righteousness and so he patiently waited for the work of Jesus Christ so that now he and all the others who believed in him before the cross are in heaven. So faith has always equaled righteousness. Old Testament and New Testament. The only thing, remember, that had to be removed was the consciousness of sin. That's why he had to do that. Okay, now let's finish up uh, verses 8 and 9 which are funny. Faith may uh, motivate Abraham to obey God's call and leave the familiar to discover the territory he was destined to inherit from God. So he left with only a promise without even knowing ahead of time where he was going. Abraham stepped out in faith. He lived by faith as an immigrant, legal immigrant, <laughs> in his promised land as though it belonged to someone else. He journeyed through the land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, who were persuaded that they were also co-heirs of the same promise. Okay, this is so cool. First of all, faith motivated Abraham to leave the familiar to discover. That needs to be someone's phrase, Dorina. Leave the familiar to discover. Okay, so good. Leaving the familiar is uncomfortable. But Abraham had a vision and he knew that when he arrived, he would recognize what he saw. So good, okay? So leave the familiar to discover, and he left only with the promise. If, you never, if you've never left the familiar with only a promise and you have missed out, it's the most exhilarating but also tough because you're going towards something you can't see tangibly. And you sometimes wonder if you even heard God correctly or if you're even going in the right direction. So, what he'll do is he'll send you kisses from heaven to assure you that you're on the right track. If you're not getting your kisses, which by the way, kisses represent the word uh, symbolically. But if you're not getting your kisses, like your furniture, you know, I little things like that, you might be of off track. Like that too. Mm -hmm. That's what I felt like this morning. Well, like with Gideon, I had, here I had been given Gideon a bad rap this whole time. You know, he had to have like two confirmations and angelic appearances and blah, 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 visitations. And here he was already gathering. I have to go already. back and read it again because it's like, it's not Never anything saw it. that I had ever... I have to apologize to his face when I get to heaven. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so he'll send kisses from heaven to assure you that you're on the right track. But with faith, combined with the promise, you see what others don't. It's more real to you than the things you see with your physical eyes. 
And this vision infused with faith along with patience is what gets you to the goal. And that, uh, just to go back real quick, in Hebrews 6.12 it says, Don't allow your hearts to grow dull, dull or lose your enthusiasm. But follow the example of those who fully received what God had promised because of their strong faith and patient endurance. That's a good scripture. Okay, now here's, this is going to bless you guys, this next idea. Listen to this. I mean, I know there's probably been like bombs here and bombs there, and you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Because that's why I love faith so much. There's so much to it. But Abraham lived in his promised land as though it belonged to someone else. What? And then he persuaded Isaac and Jacob that they too were heirs of this same promised land. But they were living in the land as if it wasn't theirs. Wait a minute. I thought they were supposed to be living in the land as if it was theirs. Here's the thing. Have you ever lived among others that are already living in the promise that you're not yet in? See, that's the thing. It's an inter inter interesting paradox to be in. Here it is. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob already knew that land was theirs. And yet at the time it wasn't theirs. So they're living in a land that's not theirs, although they know it's theirs. That's the paradox of times where you're in between the promise and in between the fulfillment, where it's like everybody you know is actually living in the promise that you want to have. And that season of time is to expose any offense or jealousy in your heart. Are you going to celebrate other people that are living in the promises? When you're in that place of paradox? Or are you going to start getting fussy and pity parties? And, Man, I wish I could have that. They're not any more spiritual than I am. Yeah, tests that you don't know about are the most dangerous. Hezekiah, did he lived according to everything David did. And then in a place of prosperity and abundance, when the Rulers from Babylon came. He showed them everything he possessed. The worst thing you could do. I mean, obviously, Hezekiah was not a D. You never show everything you've got. <laughs> you know what I mean? You hold your cards close to your vest, sir. Shows them everything. Why? Because he needed to prove to them that Israel was just as powerful and just as strong and just as prosperous as Babylon. And guess what? Isaiah said, what did you do? Well, I just showed them everything I owned. Well, because of that, they're going to come and one day take everything and your sons will become eunuchs in their kingdom. He's like, well, as long as it doesn't happen while I'm alive. Yeah. Oh. He was being tested and it says the Lord withdrew to see what he would do. The strongest temptation to lose your dependence on God is when you are blessed. If you can learn to hold on to that dependency when you're blessed in whatever area it is, that is the strongest place you can be in. It's real easy to depend on God when you have lack. It ain't that easy to depend on God when you have everything that you could ask for. Right? Whether it's material, spiritual, it doesn't matter. Why do people fall at the end? Because they're at a place where they feel they've arrived and they've lost their need for God. I thought it was interesting because in this 11, went through and marked. Faith brings our hope. Faith moved. This is the passion, how faith translated, faith opened, faith motivated, faith embraced, faith rested, faith operated, faith inspired, faith prompted, faith stirred, faith pulled down, and faith provided. I just thought that was interesting. Can you send those to us? And yeah, maybe, I will. maybe we're supposed to write a devotion. I don't uh, know. Because but I thought that was interesting <laughs> that it was like the superhero of the, the verse. It was because faith was doing these yeah, things. Yeah, faith is a superhero. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But That's I had good. not noticed that before. Well, all I don't it know does. if it's that way I don't know if it's that way in the other translations, but I just got to notice and it was like That's good. Yeah. The action it uh, faith yeah. inspires. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Can you send those to us later? Yeah. Okay. I mean, we could just talk about this all day, but I'm sure you guys will probably be like, oh my gosh. Okay. For people that live in promises, by the way, guys, for like, you know, visionaries and people that are always looking to the next thing God wants to do, you will 
you can tend to always feel out of time. Okay? But when you see someone in front of you that they're living in the promise, just say, I'm next. That's one of the best things I learned years ago. I'm next. All right, let's finish up. Uh, Hebrews 11.10, I'm just going to touch on this because next week we're actually going to take a pause and we're going to dive into the revelation God gave me uh, Monday concerning this verse. It says, His eyes of faith, Abraham's, were set on a city with unshakable foundations whose architect and builder is God himself. Uh, so they were continually, he was continually receiving that city. This is where you become so convinced of the promise of God that your faith keeps you in a place of continuous reception even if you die before seeing it. So continuous faith keeps you in continuous reception of the promise. Can you write that? Continuous faith keeps you in continuous reception of the promise. We use that as a quote. Sarah is hilarious. Okay, let's look at her. That stinker. In continuous reception of the promise. Okay, Sarah's faith embraced, there it is, God's miracle power to conceive even though she was barren and was past age of childbearing. In other words, she was old. She's an old lady, you know, power surges and such. For the through with power surges. Yeah, she's through <laughs> at this point. For the authority of her faith rested. Now get that. The authority of her faith rested in the one who made the promise. That's an important phrase. And she tapped into his faithfulness, or we could say the spirit of faith, right? So the authority of her faith rests in the one who made the promise, and she tapped into his faithfulness. In fact, so many children were subsequently fathered by this aged man of faith, one who was as good as dead, because he was, you know, was all too old, that he now has offspring as innumerable, as innumerable as the sand on the seashore and the stars in the sky. Okay, this is comical. If it wasn't inspired by Holy Spirit, let me... It's story time if you want to close your eyes. I'm going to read to you Genesis 18. It won't take me long. It says, And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre. I don't even know how you say it. And he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day, and he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. So in other words, it sounds like he maybe he took a cat nap, and all of a sudden he opened his, opens his eyes, and there's Jesus and two angels. And when he saw him, he ran from the tent door to meet him, bowed himself to the earth and said, O Lord, and that's Yahweh, by the way, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet. Rest yourselves under the tree while I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after, you, after that, you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So he said, well, do as you said. So Abraham went quickly into the tent of Diane. I mean, I'm sorry, Sarah, because of hospitality. That's right. <laughs> and said, quick, <laughs> three seeds of fine flour, knead it, make cakes. Then Abraham ran to the herd. He took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the young man. He prepared it quickly. They took uh, curds and milk. I don't know what that is. And the calf that he had prepared and set before them, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. Now, guys, you got to get this. This wasn't like he went over to McDonald's and picked up a couple burgers. Can you imagine cooking back then over fire? And what the heck is curds? Oh, okay. So he's like, one guy's, you know, slaughtering a calf.